Guys, I want to welcome you to another episode of the Advisory Board uh, podcast, where I, I bring in experts in the franchising community that can help you improve your brand and improve your ability to to uh, to franchise your business. I've got with me Jesse Kaiser today. So, uh, Jesse, I'm trying to remember where we met. It was at a conference. We had a good conversation. I was like, oh, dude, we got to talk more because Jesse is like the king of multi-unit, not the only king right there. Was, was it Springboard or Unconference or IFA? Uh, I think it might have been unconference and then springboard that we we okay. hung out twice. Uh, yeah, good memory actually. It's you know going to be one of those three. Um, but uh, Jesse, you're, you're the the co-founder of 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 Kaiser Enterprises with your brother. But the thing about you I thought was interesting is you guys have five five different brands that you operate in, and you've got almost fifty units operating. Like these guys are bigger than a lot of the franchise brands that might be listening today. So, yeah, so, so currently we're uh, actively operating uh, Ideal Image Medical Spas. That's a joint venture project with the corporate office. And then we're franchisees of OxyFresh Carpet Cleaning and Sport Club Haircuts. And in the past, for many, many years, we were a Little Caesars franchisee, probably 18 years or so. That was our first brand. And then we were a Valpac franchisee from like 2008 to about 2011 or 12. Awesome. Guys, thank you for, for correcting that too, because I, I was thinking you still operated five, but you have operated five. But now no, we, we, we've had some wonderful opportunities to to exit at a, a great multiple and roll that into a new concept. And yeah, uh, yeah so we just took advantage of a, a great opportunity. Yeah, good for you guys. And start got your start in SIU. So we were Southern Illinois guys at heart, which I can appreciate. That's where I grew up. So uh, tell us a little bit more about you, though, and about you know, you're the chair of the MUFC this year. Tell us a little yeah, bit the, about the what franchise multi unit conference. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been attending this conference for the last 10 years, and I it is the number one conference that I enjoy going to. My brother enjoys going. My wife even enjoys. She's like, this is the one conference I'm not missing. And uh, basically, you know, you're going when you are a franchisee and your brand has a national conference, you're going to meet with the best of class in your brand. Mm -hmm. uh, this is that next level because those best of class are all going to this conference. And so I, I have made lifelong friends. I've made business partners and, and, and other deals with uh, competitors of mine. Now, they're in the haircutting industry, but they have different franchise brands, but we're not in the same market. So we're not directly competing with each other. But there's enough commonality that we just made a bond. And, uh, you know, they're one of the top uh, performers in Supercuts and another one's the top performer in Great Clips. And, uh, you know, we we share our best back office practices with each other and and mm -hmm. share advice and talk about our failures just as much as our successes. It's, it's really supportive. And the conference also has some amazing keynote speakers every year. This year, we have Jim Collins, uh, the author of Good to Great. So. Yeah. Jim not only is going to do his uh, keynote, he's actually going to do a, a breakout workshop oh, wow. uh, after the keynote. And okay. then of course, this year, we've got a brand new um, track of panels, and it's deal dealing all with developing, managing, hiring and recruiting and leading district or area managers, which is brand new for the conference. Because if you're a multi-unit operator, you're going to have to have district managers, right? And the one thing that any franchise brand I've ever seen, they can give you an operations manual that you can hand to a store manager, but they don't really have a good operations manual for a multi-unit manager. And the reason is, is because their job is really determined based on the strengths and weaknesses of the owner, right? So yeah. if the owner is great at recruiting, they don't have to do a lot of recruiting. If the owner is great at marketing, they don't have to do a lot of marketing. Um, but they do have to pick up some other things. Like I, I don't fix drywall very well. So I, my district managers have to fix all, all the holes in the wall from the customers or just, you know, normal use that happens in busy salons and restaurants. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. And that, that leads us right into the topic. So I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Our, um, our topic is, is like, what are some of the challenges and the things that you look for as a guy who's, who's been in that many brands has operated and exited uh, successfully built up, you know, micro empires in a brand. Like, what are the things you're looking for uh, as you're looking at what's what's the next brand you want to acquire? Yeah. And so, brand, go ahead. Well, give me one second. But like brands, you've got to be thinking about what do you need to structure slightly differently so that you can attract a guy like a Jesse to want to buy into your brand. So Jesse, you're going to say something. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Well, so you know, I think a lot of my fellow franchise brethren they find uh, an industry and they get really good at it and they kind of stick at that. So like as an example. Uh, if you're 
if you're a multi-unit Burger King franchisee, you're probably also a Jersey Mike's or a Firehouse Subs or a Subway franchisee yeah. too. It's all food, right? You know, with us, we're looking at five different brands, five different industries, medical pros uh, in the med spas, uh, licensed cosmetologists in the salons, general labor in uh, the carpet cleaning, yeah. restaurant fast food workers is different than all of them. And then, uh, yeah. you know, we had to have salespeople, which is for the marketing of, of Valpac, right? So all different. We were successful in all of these. The reason was, and when I look into a new brand, is there's two criteria there. The first is I have to have a really clear understanding who the ideal customer is. And then I got to figure out who is the ideal employee for that customer. And I, I use Chick-fil-A as an example. They don't have the best chicken sandwich. It's damn good, but it's not the best, I don't think. And the reason they have a line is because those are all people that normally are not going through the Taco Bell drive through And there's a reason for that. It's not because Chick-fil-A fried chicken is any healthier. It's because they've got employees that make those customers feel like that's where they want to go. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the secret sauce, right? So they've really identified like we have no competition if we attract these type of customers with these type of employees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great example. Uh, I do like their chicken stuff. It's a little bit cleaner, less greasy, but but it's really not amazing versus like, uh, I don't know, some a lot of people have better chicken, I think. Um, but their sauce is pretty good. and it is, It's still a good experience overall. I, I'm I never going to turn down Chick-fil-A, but there's there's no secret sauce. There's no... no but you, you nailed the point, right? The secret sauce there is the way they staff, the way yep. they run, the way their menu is. So how clean the restaurant is. Like they know their, their, their ideal client and yep. they cater to it. It's the busy mom that wants to give their kids a better experience in a clean place where they're going to be treated very politely, consistent. And, and feel safe and comfortable, right? Yeah. And yeah. they do. Yeah, that place is always jammed up with, with uh, you know, moms with multiple kids. Like it's a smart Yeah, so that, that's one side of the equation. I won't move into an industry unless I feel very comfortable about the answer for both those questions, the ideal customer and ideal employee. And then the other one is, it, it's two-part financial question. The first part is, how fast can I make my investment back? And we're talking, you know, in months. Uh, 36 months is pretty pretty sweet spot for me. If I can find anything quicker than 36, I get really excited about it. When you start to trail off into 50 or 60 months, I get a little less enthusiastic about it. Uh -huh. And then the other part is, is, and this has kind of been more of a realization over the last few years, is I'm looking at that brand's 50%, the median average unit volume, and the multiple to exit. And is that that math, is it more than what it costs to open the location? Yeah, let's let's break that one down. So you're looking yeah. at two specific things there that I bet a lot of franchise brands are not not planning for or thinking about. So breaking yeah, I, down, I I didn't I didn't think about this until actually a couple of years ago at the multi unit conference. I was watching this powerhouse of a panel, mm -hmm. and they were talking about these things. And we had just sold our little Caesars, and we we made great money on those, right? And we got a great multiple on it. Um, but you know, we were able to exit very close to what we paid for a lot of the stores. But I'm buying sport clips many times much cheaper than what it costs to build them. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of the brand. It's I'm buying um, distressed locations. So I'm yep. getting a good deal. But I'm looking at the average. And the average uh, sport clips right now, you know, it costs, you're going to make more selling it than what it costs to open. If you've if you got a good volume you should, with the multiples that they have. So it's yep. a good investment to me. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And you're looking at the median of the of the build out cost. Yeah, right at fifty percent, right uh, of the AUV, not the top twenty five or top ten percent. Just like what is the average franchisee doing? Because mm -hmm. I'm gonna hope at best I'm average, right? I want to be more. I want to strive for more, but at best I need to be average. Yeah, for the math to work, right? Yeah, <clears throat> perfect. Yeah, and and just I mean I don't need you to share like any any financials yourself, but like what are you typically seeing since you've done and you've exited two different concepts now, right? Yep. Yeah. What what type what type of multiple should people be thinking about if they're listening? Like I want to buy a franchise, I want to get into multi units. What type? I, of I think I think uh, you know with brick and mortar stuff, I think that three to three and a half times multiple is um, a good number for both parties. I mean. I, I the reason I don't own more locations right now is because I've got uh, franchisees that feel like their business is more like a five or six multiple, mm -hmm. um, and I, I just don't think the valuation's re realistic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but three, at three, three and a half, especially if I'm taking on the same brand, that's a great deal because I work a little harder for a couple of days, 
And then I pass that location off to one of my district managers that absorbs it into the operations. That's the power of franchising is I can kind of right dial in. If you tell me what your net sales are and you tell me what your rent is, because I'm already in the brand, I already know what the performer looks like. I already know what the bottom line should look like, or at least how I run it. Yeah. And I can make a, I can make a good offer that I feel like is fair for the the seller and, and great for the buyer. Yeah. And often if they're, if they're in a position where they're a little distressed there, they'll be lucky to get the multiple you give them uh, and, and you can save them the the effort of having to try to hit a transfer or close down. You know, that's, that's not a pretty process. You, you know, um, and very early in my years, we were just opening, 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 no acquisitions. And part of it was um, things were a lot uh, more inexpensive to open than they are now, right? And we were the grand opening kings of all of our concepts. So we could open up a restaurant or a salon and we would cash flow right away. So we were like, why would we do that and pay three and a half times when we can get it down to l less than three on our own? Um, the truth was, is that, you know, I'm open in four or five locations a year. I'm living 20 weeks plus out of hotels because I'm opening up these in other markets, not anywhere close to home. Yeah. And I, I want to have more than four a year growth. So that forced me into acquisitions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but here is an interesting thing and in how I look at brands right now. So, you know, Sport Clips is a great example. So it's been franchising now for about 25 years mm -hmm. and about 15 years ago. That's when they started really steaming up and, and building locations. And you think about the average age of a brand new franchisee is like 40 to 45. And, you know, that generation I'm talking about now, 15 years later, that's still of the generation that feels like about 65, they should be retiring and, and doing something with the grandkids. Yeah. So we're seeing a huge interest, uh, the baby boomers and they're very early. Well, it's the baby boomers. The, the baby boomers are starting to retire and there's less of my generation so there's going to be more supply than demand, and that's going to drive the multiple down. So I think it's a great time to be in franchising. And I'm looking for brands that have 20 plus years of franchising experience because there's about to be a churn, not because it's a bad brand or bad performance. It's just the average owner is aging out and wants to do something else besides be a business owner. Yeah, that's a really interesting way to look at it. I mean, Adam's invisible hand is your, your friend right now with these economic models, right? And you're, I've been seeing that more and more. And it, you're right, the brands that are in that stage where you know, 15 years ago, they boomed, and they've been growing since then. Uh, that's a really great place to look for acquisitions because supply demand like that. that you know, it's I, I hear you. That's clever. Well, and the other thing, too, is, uh, you know, if you're going into an emerging brand and don't get me wrong, there's great pluses to be going into an emerging brand, too. But, you know, you're wanting to eventually get to 50 units in the next seven years. That's a lot of acquisition. Right. Well, if the system only has 70 units, you, you're probably not going to buy 50 of them. Uh, because they're so new that they've got young guys and girls in there being franchisees and they're excited and they're growing the brand in their market. So, you know, you, if you're looking for that kind of quick growth and acquisitions, you need to find more of a mature brand where there's enough locations and the age of the franchisee is a little bit older. So you're not waiting for decades or waiting years. And does that deter you? So, I mean, are, is there a type of an emerging brand that would attract you or are you really just kind of in the established brands want to acquire and, and roll up? What, 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 what would attract you about an emerging brand? Uh, it, option D all above, you know, <laughs> if it's, if it's exciting uh, and you like, it, 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 again, it goes back to the ROI. You know, if, if there was a concept that I would make my money back in 24 months, but I had to open them all, I, I could figure out a structure and get enough team in place that they're going out and they're the ones staying in the hotel rooms most of the time. So I don't have to, right. And I can multiply that with multiple people. Uh, I remember a great, great quote. I was told, if you want to go somewhere fast, you got to do it by yourself. But if you want to go somewhere far, you got to do it with others. Mm -hmm. So it would be a situation now where I've, I've got enough money where I can afford to bring on that staff to do that, but I'm, I can't do it by myself. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Yeah, especially I mean, you guys are stretched pretty thin as you're trying to do that by yourself. Well, with your brother too, but um, yeah. So, so if you're if you're looking at emerging brand things that would attract you, just the financials, the model, getting your REO twenty four month to thirty. You know, months. and the the exciting thing that uh, all the A plus locations are still available. You know, so the reason I'm in uh, Sport Clips in five different states is. Uh, I got in early enough that I could still cherry pick, but they had to be like rural, rural markets and, and somewhat distant, 
you know, I mean, uh, I'm in five states and it's because I knew if I drove up to Lansing, Michigan, I could open up a real powerhouse location up there because there was no other sport clips in that location, in that city, right. right. As an example, but St. Louis, we never built one of the locations we own. We've acquired all the St. Louis ones because they were all there before we even came to St. Louis. Yeah. So that's interesting. And, um, what, when you're deciding what territory to look for, you know, A plus locations, obviously, right? You're, 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 you're traffic. How, when you're looking at A minus location, B plus, what do you look for? Like, or is that something you're willing to share with us? Yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, street visibility and rent are the the two and total rent, right? Sometimes people are like, oh, this is great, but I, I, I'm up in Michigan and sometimes those cams are pretty deadly uh, with all the snow. Yeah. So um just total cost of rent and can people find it that's the that's the big thing for all the concepts that i've looked at or want to get into is that there needs to be a lot of visibility you don't have to be a freestander you don't have to be on a hard corner or an end cap but you know whatever sign you have it needs to be very clear and visible by both directions of traffic yeah that makes perfect sense um well let's let's shift gears for a minute so there's a lot that we should be thinking about when it comes to uh the franchise is being ready to, to support multi-unit owners. What are some of the the things that you've run into, Jesse, that that have shown you that maybe that brand wasn't quite ready, and things that things that brands need to have ready if they want to really support multi-unit owners like yourself? Well, I, fortunately, I've had really good experiences with all my brands. Good. Uh, but I talked to enough franchisees, and I'm friends with enough franchisors too that I've heard a lot of horror stories. Right. Um, I, I would put it this way. Um, a very well established brand doesn't care about your feedback. You're not gonna you're not gonna change the the rudder whatsoever of the ship uh-huh. uh, because you just don't have enough unit volume to to show up on their radar as something that like you have a good pulse on it. Like you know, Little Caesars as an example had you know a hundred times the corporate company locations that I had. Mm-hmm. You know, so they've got their fingers on on the data a lot better than I do. Uh, but then you look at sport clips and it's that in between mm-hmm. where um, I I could give some input and it was taken into consideration, but they also had corporate stores. They didn't have 10 times or a hundred times the locations, but, you know, and so you can uh, change the, the direction by a degree or two. And then if you get into a young brand um, and you've got a founder that is excited and, and thinks that you've got good ideas, you got to be really careful because, They'll steer that ship right off to the left side of uh, your destination, huh. and you know sometimes you're guilty of just thinking out loud and you know collaborating and brainstorming with somebody, and they're like, "That's a good idea," and all of a sudden, phew, they're going for it. So, I think the size and the maturity of the founder or the the management team uh, has a lot to do with that. As they get older and more mature, I, I feel like it's it's better and better. That's interesting. So, I mean, so it's kind of a balance point, right, between like if they're too small uh and their and their leadership teams too i don't immature in yeah, then uh then then it's pr- probably not the right fit uh I guess no I, I i wouldn't say that what i would say is is that as a franchise a multi-unit franchisee you're just mm-hmm. going to have to uh be aware that you have a lot more influence than you do in other uh franchise concepts so just you know you with great power comes great responsibility so to speak <laughs> yeah, Uncle Ben. Yeah, ben, exactly. Uncle ben, Uncle ben. So you, you just got to be aware that, uh, you know, and here's a great thing about those kind of relationships, a franchise or that just wants to make sure the franchisee is happy is a wonderful relationship. Mm-hmm. But it, you can think about it it's like a parent and child relationship as well. It's like the parent that gives the child everything they want tends to be spoiled and and not satisfactory. So I think there has to be some restraint from the franchise or too, and, and some of the discipline of all that. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. It's the balance point, uh, really. But but uh, you mentioned something to me pre pre uh, conversation for the podcast. I, I want to bring up here, which is <clears throat> when when you're dealing with a, fra- a multi unit franchise brand, <clears throat> it's really helpful to see that not not only are they do they have a good concept, but they're also running a successful couple of locations. Do you want to elaborate on that? Like, yeah, why I, I don't yeah. think I would ever sign up for a franchise concept that the uh, corporate or the founder doesn't personally own multiple units themselves. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, if, if, if the concept's so great and so easy to run or not so complex that it's not overbearing, uh, why wouldn't you drink more of your own Kool-Aid? 
Yeah. Yeah. Now I will say this, that uh, I know some franchisors that actually are franchisees of other concepts, but those are unique situations. And it would be like where they've got corporate locations all over this road, but mm -hmm. a new piece of real estate opened up and they couldn't put another one of their locations there because it would just cannibalize from the other two. So they become like a Wendy's franchise or a Jersey Mike's franchisee because they had an opportunity to buy the real estate and make another investment. Yeah, no, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, but, but there, there's kind of a two edged sword with that, like ownership model, right? So if, if the franchisee owns or franchisor owns tons of model or tons of units, they're cash flowing a lot. Uh, you need to make sure they know how to operate the units, but what's the downside? Like, is there, is there a downside if they own, let's say a couple hundred locations corporately, does that mean that they don't listen to the franchisees as much? Or I like mean, I think if you've got a situation where there's more corporate locations than franchise locations, then you're an afterthought for sure. Because it, whether you're in the hamburger business, the chicken business, or the pizza business, uh, if you're a franchisor, you're no longer in that. You are in the relationship business. And if that's not your number one priority, I want my relationships with everyone to be a top priority, right? My relationship with my brother is a top priority, vice versa. And I want my relationship with my franchisors to be a top priority for them and as well for me. Like I'm never going to be dismissive to their uh, ideas, suggestions, or, or brand requests. And I, I would like the same courtesy brought back to me. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's, uh, that's valid because they're again, talking about the balance point, if they don't have corporate stores and they get disconnected uh, from, from the, uh, how the, well, you, the are. scary thing is, is, and I'm happy to pay uh, a royalty uh, right. because there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that most people have no idea that a franchisor does or supports or their cost for it. But one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to pay that royalty and still have to do the research and development in my my locations, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, because a lot of times the research and development is expensive and it's tiresome and you'll burn through employees, you could lose customers. I'd rather the corporate locations figure that out yeah. and then and then take their winnings and their success stories to me as a franchisee. Yeah, I, I see that. I mean, especially in like restaurant concepts, uh, that that's a very expensive process to do R&D. But but any of them, it really can be. That that makes sense. Tell me tell me Jesse about um, as you built because now let's talk about just you for a minute. Uh, sure. As you're building building an empire, like let's say I'm I want to advise somebody how, or I'm a franchisor and I want to give people a playbook to become a multi unit owner. I'm surprised fewer have this, or that that so few have this. Right? They should have like well, here's how to operate our store. But you mentioned this kind of alluded to it before that they don't have a really good uh, ability to, to like coach you into the next phase, which is maybe owning five stores or building yeah. a 50 store empire. You know, I would say this, that probably one of the most important things is having a strong, strong understanding of your financials. Okay. I I've got, I've got friends that are pretty successful in different concepts and only to find out that they're doing all their bookkeeping on Excel. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would say if you're wanting to be a, a large multi-unit operator and do it safely and correctly, understand the financials 100%. Don't sign a lease or something you don't understand what the repercussions of. If, if it doesn't go well, not every location is a home run. I've had to close down what I thought were great locations that I picked out, I built out, I staffed, I spent lots of money in marketing to bring in the customers, but they never came because at the end of the day, I built it too close to one of my other locations. And you know, an, another thing is it's called the elbow of a strip center. Never want to be in the elbow of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know what you're talking about. No one will see in the elbow. And yeah. well, the rent's cheap there. So I was pretty excited about it. But then I realized, yeah, no one can actually see your signage. That stinks. I see your point. Yeah. So uh, location, location, location. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So what else should be in this playbook? So I'm a franchisor and you know, lots of, so lots of leadership, lots of like le leadership learning, getting, getting exposed to different types of leadership styles um, because, you know, everyone's got their own innate leadership style, but as you get bigger, you're going to have managers and district managers. They're going to have different leadership styles and you got to be able to communicate with them and, and coach them with their style. The worst thing you could do is have a manager and there's more than one leadership style that's positive and can be successful. So, um, but understanding how they connect with their team, that's really important. So you can coach them that way. If you coach them only in your leadership style, um, you're going to burn out a lot of people trying to be something they're not. 
right? And then the other thing is, uh, the other thing about the power of franchising, and let's forget about having multiple brands, just you've got one brand. And let's say the franchise or has 250 operational units across the country. Mm -hmm. There's a good number of franchisees there that you should be comparing your information against on a regular basis. Whether the franchisor facilitates that or you guys get together and do like a profit keeping mastermind thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've been able to do that. And we were able to find out that I missed a price increase on our product in our salons because I'm responsible for the price increases, right? Changing the prices so it matches up. And we were looking at everyone else's like our cost of goods is a little bit higher than everyone else's. And it shouldn't be, it should be identical. Yeah. Because there's really no waste. And, um, you know, just doing that saved me a lot of money because that was a quick 10 minute transaction fix in, in the office on a POS system to get that all fixed. Yeah. But it was one of those things where I got emailed the price updates from the vendor and it just, it was still in my inbox, but it was buried, <laughs> buried in there, you know? So I like, I love that. That would be an example of, you know, and so as an example, but you know, that money, I don't, I don't have a number of what that is, but it was, it's significant enough. And it probably would translate over a year into a salary of another employee. Yeah. So it's like a free employee to me, you know? Yeah. Or, the, or you didn't lose an employee because you missed that, that price increase adjustment. That's crazy valuable. Tell me about how, how often have you been involved in like mastermind groups within a franchise? Um, so, I mean, since day one with Little Caesars, that was our first brand. I mean, when we had our first location open, they were bringing all the local uh, franchisees together from, you know, a two hour, three hour drive. And we were sharing, you know, with each other, what we were spending on uh, marketing, what type of marketing, how much labor was, what our rents were, what our power bills were. Uh, and there was opportunities to save money on the power bills. Wow. Yeah, that, that's a key expense when you've got electric. Were they electric ovens? No, they weren't. They're gas. But, you know, you've got a walk-in cooler that's it's electric. And then we were, as an example, we had extra coolers because we were a really busy location. So we had extra coolers for all of our two liters. Okay. And uh, those those extra coolers that are in the back that the customer never sees, you know, we're they're like your power bill is high. We were kind of going over everything. They're like, just put your extra two liters in your walk in cooler. Oh, oh OK. Yeah, that makes sense because you're already paying to keep that thing cool. Right. So yeah. we, we called Pepsi up and said, hey, you could take this cooler back. We're not going to need it anymore. And that was an example because those coolers are not the most uh, efficient. The soda coolers they are not the most efficient yeah. with electricity. Would but that's cool. an example too, where we save money because we're just sharing ideas. As far as masterminds outside of uh, outside of franchising, you know, we were in franchising when I discovered a, a group called Strategic Coach, and mm -hmm. it's for high functioning entrepreneurs. And I'm also in another organization called Genius Network. It's again for high functioning entrepreneurs that have a flair or interest in marketing and lifestyle hacks. Right. So uh, I'm learning things from these guys and girls every time I meet with them. And sometimes it has nothing to do with business. It has everything to do with relationships or being a better parent. Like there's lots of opportunities to be a better well-rounded person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I've, uh, I got involved in masterminds years ago and I, and you know, just a, this isn't the podcast focus, but I think it's important for people to be thinking about. And a friend of mine was running a group and a friend of mine was in a group and I was like, I'll, I'll check it out. And I realized the power of it. That's why Napoleon Hill talked about it. But his he stole that idea from the Juntas, which were which were uh, Benjamin Franklin. You think about a guy who got a crap ton done, founded the fire uh, the fire departments in this country, founded the library system, founded the post office, like was yeah. discovering things, ran a printing press. Like the guy was all over the place and did so much. But it was because the power of his network and the advice that he got. And the he guy was the first franchisor too. <laughs> was he of what first franchise or in America of his printing press? Oh, I didn't realize that he'd franchise that out. Yeah. Uh, to other, uh, local, uh, newspapers. Yeah. That's hilarious. I didn't know that also. He's well, a patron state of franchising. I call him. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Well, I love that. So, but I, I, I just got to tell you like the value of getting involved in these groups, sometimes just having third party, Third parties that have a vested interest in your success because they're part of this group because you're going to invest in their success. I found it to be really invaluable. So if you're not doing it, just want to make sure you get a plug from me and from Jesse that you need to find one that's relevant to you. If you got it in inside of a brand, perfect. And if you've got multiple brands that you own, you need to get outside advice. I think it's still perfect. You just need to get involved in these things. 
Yeah, Jesse, I know that uh, you know, we we don't have we don't have another thirty minutes. We could go down this path and like talk oh, about our masterminds and how to run them and all this stuff. But what if you were going to give a couple more words of advice to uh, two people? Uh, one is an individual looking to build their own multi-unit empire, and also then franchisors. Like, what what are some advice you'd give to those two audiences that might be listening to this about how do you get ready to and how do you successfully run multi-units? Well, I, I will uh, unashamedly say that go to the multi-unit franchise conference. And there's a reason for that. Um, like I said, I've been going for 10 years and the number of units we've had doubled. We've picked up two brands. Uh, I've found another business partner for one of our brands that, uh, you know, he's like a big brother to me now. Uh, you're going to learn. I, I'd say there's three types of people that go to this conference that are franchisees. There are people that are in love with their brand. They don't want another brand, but they want to keep growing the location, location, locations. You're going to find other franchisees there that are single branded that want to keep growing that location. The second one are franchisees that are like, uh, I love my brand, but I built out this market and I really don't want to leave this market because I love this market. So I see other opportunities. I need another brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, that's a great place to go find a brand because they have what I call hap the best happy hour in Vegas. It's three hours of open bar and hors d'oeuvres and you walk around and every franchisor that you could think of has got a 10 by 10 booth with, uh, you know, their development officer, sometimes the founders, depending on the size. And you get to go around and ask a lot of questions. And it's kind of like a mini discovery day. And you could just do 50 of them if you want over the next two days. Uh, and then the third is someone that has no interest in adding more units. They've got five and they're happy with it. They don't want another brand, but they want to learn how can I make more money off these five units? How can I go vacation in Germany and not have everything fall apart on me while I'm gone for two weeks? Yeah. Like there's franchisees that are there, there too, that are already at that point that you can learn from, ask questions, they'll mentor you. They're going to share with you their failures more than they're going to share their successes. And I think that's a real true key of someone that wants you to learn and grow. They're going to tell you about all the rakes that they stepped on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. And so for a franchisor, what you're doing is you get to interact with these, what I call whales uh, of, of franchising, and you get to hear what they really want to see in, in a, in a franchisor. And uh, I would say this, you know, there's a, I, I would say if you've got less than 50 locations, uh, we'll call you not ready for prime time. There's still value in going, just don't have a booth. In fact, too bad. It's sold out this year, maybe next year. Right. But yeah. uh, it's sold out as far as uh, vendor booths. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah franchisors. Uh, attendance for franchisees and franchisors is still open and there's no cap on that. Um, but you get to interact and you get to see and hear on these panels what really intelligent multi-unit operators are looking for and how they run their business. And every time I meet with an emerging brand franchisor and I tell them about how I do something in my operations, there's always an aha moment and they're writing down a note, right? And it's just because with 50 some units, I've been there and done it. And especially since I've got different uh, brands, like different concepts, different industries, and they're remote, like I'm managing things that are nine different time zones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, nine hours away or more uh, by drive. Uh, you're going to have to learn how do you manage that remotely and keep the brand standard and grow the business. And the great news is, you know, my, my locations that are nine hours away, I, I'm going up there for the first time this calendar year to visit the team and look for a new location. And they're up in sales. They're up in sales. Now I interact with the district manager on a daily basis, but uh, I don't need to be there. And so there's some value in that. And so a franchisor can pick my brain and Boy, I'm going to tell you, as far as if you rank all the franchisees there, I'm pretty much at the average level there. There's guys and girls that are way, way more experienced with me than I am in this too. That yeah. are going to the That's fantastic. But it's also good to know. I mean, if you're, if you think that you're in franchising, you have to be the top 10% of every brand you run. It's nice to know you can have a very successful business and have a very, and have a very enjoyable experience running multiple units if you aren't the top you can operate at the average or above average i'm sure you're not targeting average but like it's okay if you're operating at the average of the industry because bear in mind you've got people that are, this is their only store it's their only livelihood they're investing everything they've got into this thing and if they're doing better than you could it probably should be uh for that but you can still have a great business model and success without having yeah. to be at the top and if the bones of the franchise concept are sound and you've picked out a good location and you're diligent about your operations, making sure you're on top of it, giving good leadership and support, you know, you should make money if even if you're at the 50 percentile, 
of all the net sales, you should be making money and getting a good return. Yeah, I, th- I can't remember if it was David Barr. It was one of the keynotes at one of the conferences that recently. He said, look, the key to franchising this is, is on an average day, an average operator with average experience can make above average returns. Like that's really what franchising should be. And like you're saying, the bones, if the bones produce that type of a yield, then you've got the right franchise. Uh, and so I, I appreciate you sharing those insights with us. Jesse, anything else uh, aside from, I'll, I'll plug it. Uh, M- MUFC last year we went to, great, great content, good people. It was The place was filled with people that were eager to help find people to build their franchise ecosystem, but also people that were eager to find the next concept to build their franchise uh, empire. So I, I just, I'll just second that, that plug that it was a great event. Uh, what, what else, any, any parting thoughts for if I'm a franchisor and I'm trying to get ready to, to bring on multi-units, what's one more thing I ought to be thinking about so I'm ready for that? Make is not about the conference, but in general, make sure your item 19 is clear, understandable, and very profitable. And, uh, you know, a good return for me as a franchisee needs to be 15 to 20% okay. after I pay my marketing and after I pay my uh, royalties and everything like that. So, um, I think franchisors that try to drive the bottom line to be as big as possible are the ones that win every time. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. You're spot on. Jesse Kaiser, you've been awesome. Thanks so much. And uh, and I hope everything goes well as you're wrapping up the prep and getting ready to launch MUFC this year. Yeah. And Dave, it's uh, March 19th through the 20th, 22nd. So I'd love to see as many people come out as they can. I really appreciate you having me on your show and uh, have a great time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Look forward to it.